The following is a production of Shark Flight Media. Now entering the nexus of geekery and guy world in three, two, one, mark. Do you know what the secret of life is? One thing, just one thing. You know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. This is the Dudes in Hyperspace podcast. Hey, kids, welcome back to a monumental edition of the Dudes in Hyperspace podcast. I am your host, Ian J. Malone. Going to be joined here in just a few minutes by my usual partners in crime. That would, of course, be Rob Howell and Kevin Steverson. But before we get started, we've got to pay some bills, starting first with our brand new partners, and that would, of course, be the fine folks over at the Believe Podcast Network. Folks, this is the number one podcast network on the net for professionals, so it doesn't matter what you like in terms of your podcast content. If you're a sports fan, they got it. If you're into news and politics, they have got it. If you're a mystery fan, you like mysteries, conspiracy theories, that kind of content, they've got that too. Crap, they've got over 400 shows, y'all. Like, these people are stacked with content if you're a podcasting nut like we are on this show. So go check them out at Believe.com. That's Believe, so spelled B-L-E-A-V.com. Make sure you go check them out, support them. Tell them you found uh, found out about them through the Dudes in Hyperspace and uh, and. Good Lord, man. We are so excited to be a part of them. Also excited, as always, to be presented by Chris Kennedy Publishing. Uh, CKP, man, those folks have supported us from the start, and we love them for it. We say it every show because it's true, y'all. Doesn't matter what you like to read, whether it's military science fiction, whether it's space opera, whether it's urban fantasy, high fantasy, paranormal romance, even stuff about the craft if you fancy yourself as a writer. And we've got lots of stuff for you on that front with later on uh, with tonight's show. They've got it all there at CKP. So go check them out. Out. ChrisKennedyPublishing.com is where it's at. You can read all about their authors, their series, their books, their short stories. Even sign up for their newsletter while you're there and get yourself a free ebook. Again, that's ChrisKennedyPublishing.com. Chris Kennedy Publishing, they are message free sci fi with a slice of fantasy. So, speaking of my guys, let's go ahead and bring those fellas in. Rob, Kevin, how are we doing this evening, fellas? <clears throat> Go dogs. Oh, good Lord. You realize we're past that, right? It doesn't matter. Uh, we got to worry about next season. We're, we're going to talk about writing tonight, Kevin. We're, <laughs> we're going to table the Georgia Bulldogs uh-huh. talk for now. Uh, we will talk Super Bowl even. stuff later, but no, uh, no, this is a Georgia free zone unless you're talking about Matt Stafford. Then maybe I'll give you a pass. That's right. Yeah, Matt. Yeah, Sony Michael running. Oh, yeah. Okay. we we'll talk about it later. Just keep a lid on it. Rob, how we doing, man? I'm doing pretty good. I mean, really... Excited about this Believe thing. I really want to uh, take a moment here and, and thank you, Ian, for going to all the work and trouble to get with those guys and set this up and create an opportunity for us to reach a whole bunch of new people and grow at this, level up in both our writing and our podcasting and all of our professional lives. Great work, Ian. Well, I appreciate it. But, you know, I mean, we've we've said this before on this show. We try and partner with people that we think are going to benefit our listeners. All right. So whether it's CKP and the books that they write, whether it's the the IASFA folks, International Association of Science Fiction and Fantasy Authors, who sponsor our Podmail segment, all of these companies bring something to the table that hopefully the listeners of the dudes in hyperspace get something out of, whether it's a good read or a good podcast or a fun new author to follow. The Believe folks are, are no different. You know, I mean, again, they are the number one podcast network on the net for professionals. And the dude, as sports fans alone, there are gobs of shows there to eat up. Um, I've already been having some conversations with one of their golf pros, uh, a guy named Cam Rogers, who's a moonlighter freelancer for CNN, uh, CBS Sports on on topics like the PGA and, and online betting, uh, we're going to try and get him on the show to do a little bit of master's talk later on next month because that's going to be coming up in April. So, you know, that's that's the joy of this is we get to branch out and be part of a community of podcasters. So that means cross promotions. That means access to other guests, all of which hopefully our listeners will will enjoy having aboard. So. You know, big, big shout out to the Believe folks for for taking the time to talk with us uh, this week and meet with me. Um, it's been a pleasure working with them so far. I mean, it really, really has been. They've been super accommodating. They answer all of my many, 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 many questions, <laughs> uh, like many questions. And they also send me tons of great resources to help me get better as a producer and a talent. And uh, and I'm, I'm just excited, man. I think it's going to be a great marriage, a great partnership with people helping people. And that's kind of what we're all about here. I agree, but I just want to re- remind everybody out there that all of this um, 
uh, gathering together of people that we think are going to be good for the show. That's Ian's work. <laughs> well, and, and Ian may try and deflect the credit here, but I want it flat out obvious that Ian has put a lot of time and effort into this. And I really appreciate it. Well, I, I appreciate it, fellas. Like I said, I, I just hope the listeners enjoy this show. And uh, as always, guys, you know, if you got something you want to say to us, if you want to give us a little feedback on that, maybe somebody you'd like to hear on the show, shoot us an email, dudesinhyperspace at gmail.com. You can also tweet at Shark Flight with hashtag dudes in hyperspace or comment on one of our many Facebook posts. Dude, that was a silky smooth segue. Like, I'm so proud. Just patting the back, patting the back right now. All righty, speaking of things to pub, <laughs> let's go ahead and do our open segment, which we are now going to haul, uh, call henceforth the news. And now the news. All right, so the news is formerly called our, again, our open segment. This is kind of the point in the show when we briefly go around the horn about our various writing projects, the stuff that we've got working, uh, if we're doing any cons, any events, places we're going to be, so on and so forth. So, Rob, I'm going to give you a uh, lead on this one. What, what's happening in your world for writing and events? Well, it's been a heck of a week for me. Uh, Keen Edge of Valor, the next uh, Libri Valoris uh, anthology that'll be released at uh, Liberty, Con or excuse me, at Fantasy, is basically in the can. Um, we uh, made huge progress on Deadly Fortune, the next Elder's Legacy novel, and next week I am really excited to go to Superstars in Colorado Springs. This is a this is a, a seminar, a writing seminar. So it's more more of a, an opportunity for me to learn than a traditional convention. And the the instructor list is star-studded. Kevin J. Anderson, Jody Lynn Nye, Jim Butcher. I mean, on down the line, uh, a ton of the uh, biggest names in science fiction and fantasy and independent writing and uh, traditional publishing. They're all there, and it's going to be a chance for me to learn stuff. So I'm really excited about that. I love me some Jim Butcher, man. I will read the crap out of a Dresden Files book. That is such good stuff. Kevin, what's going on with you, man? Ah, uh, well, Kevin Ikeberry and I just uh, just last week we turned in Redacted Weapon, uh, which is the third book in you know the trilogy that we were doing the Peacemaker books and the Four Horsemen, and uh, it will be out on Fantasy Weekend. So got that going on. Just had a story come out last week. Um, I had the leadoff story in We Pay in, in You Pay We Slay, which is a uh, new Hit World anthology. So that's kind of exciting. Great and title. <laughs> yeah. At the end of this month, I will be at uh, Confinement uh, in Lebanon, Tennessee. Okay. So cool. that's that's kind of exciting. Cool. Yeah. Well, I spent my entire Kevin. You'll get a kick out of this. I spent the bulk of last weekend creating a fictional science fiction playbook for a sport. <laughs> like I got to the, so I'm, for those who don't know, I'm writing a very sports centric sci-fi novel. It's set in, in the salvage title universe. It's called the last Argonaut and it's going to follow up a, a team of, of misfits uh, of a, of a war ball franchise on a distant planet as they try and pull themselves up by the bootstraps to, to be respectable again. And it's going to have all the usual sports tropes that we love in, in those stories, whether it's the replacements, major league, longest yard, you name it. All of that stuff is going to be in there, but with tons and tons of aliens. So I say all of that to say I got to the point this past weekend in, in the first draft where I've got to I've got to start to write my first in-game action. All right. We've 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 established the story. We've established the world. Everything's there. Now it's time to write what's happening in the game. It's time to let the bullets fly and let's rock and roll. So I get out there and I start, you know, writing language. And it occurs to me, you know, I I really do need to just stop right here and make sure that this makes sense. You know, it's very easy just to get out there and throw out a whole bunch of Omahas and hot reads and, you know, all that fun lingo that football fans will probably roll their eyes out. You know, let's let's create something here that makes sense to the reader. And so my entire Saturday was spent holed up in my office researching routes, researching audibles, researching terminology for various types of systems over the last 20, 30 years of football, rugby, hockey, et cetera, and trying to weave all of that into my own language. And, and really crafting something that it's my hope when the reader gets to the end of the book, when the protagonist calls a play from the line of scrimmage, they're going to say, I know exactly where every player on that offensive squad is going to go because I, I understand. I've been taught this. I understand this language. It makes sense to me. But trying to do that without costing yourself the story and not turning it into a, you know, essentially a football playbook – like that is a fine line to straddle, man. And but it's been a lot of fun and a real challenge to write. 
So uh, anyway, that's what I've been working on. Work on the last Argonaut that does continue. And, uh, and then as far as events go, uh, I will be rolling off to beautiful Pensacola, Florida here in about a week with uh, brother Nick Steverson. And we will be hanging out around Bard's Tower uh, with Kevin Eikenberry also at Pensacon. So really excited about that. Uh, Pensacon is a convention I've wanted to do for quite some time, and I've just never been able to, to get down here to do it. And now that I live here, boom, like I get to do Pensacon. So thanks to everybody who helped to make that happen. So, all righty, well, that's going to do it on our uh, our news segment, which is going to take us into the brunt of what we came here to talk about. So, for folks who are listening to this show for the first time, in case you didn't tell by the logo, we're kind of a weird little mashup of writing stuff, genre stuff, sci-fi fantasy stuff, and then dude stuff. We call it guy world. So that's football. That's cooking. That's smoking freaking meat. You know, it's, it's music. It's all of those things that we love. And so this show kind of tends to be a kind of a, a mashup of all of those things because that's apparently what readers love to come talk with us about at conventions. Tonight, however, we're going to focus on what we do best, and that's writing stories, crafting stories. And so, you know, I want to want to kind of get on into the, the meat of what we're talking about here. If you're a new writer, uh, somebody who's looking for tips and pointers, hopefully this is something that, that you're really going to be able to get something out of. Uh, if you're a seasoned vet, hopefully maybe you get a few pointers to maybe polish up an element of your game and help you get that much better. So uh, either way, again, if you got feedback for us, hit us up at dudes at hyperspace and gmail.com or uh, shoot us a message on Facebook and Twitter. We would love to hear from you. So I want to start from the top, guys. Let's go ahead and establish for people what we are. In the world of writing, in our circles anyway, there are pincers and there are outliners. Outliners, pretty self-explanatory. You sit down, you kind of outline the, the rough structure of how your story is going to be before you start it. Pantsers, slang term for you are literally writing by the seat of your pants. You start with word one, chapter one, and you just go. Stephen King is probably the biggest example of what a pantser can be at their best. Um, so... With those two kind of terms established, Kevin, I'm going to start with you, man. Are you a pantser or are you an outliner when you get ready to tell a story? I am a pantser. <laughs> All right. I am a pantser from, from the get-go. You know, occasionally as I get into a story, I might write one sentence here, one sentence there for the next three chapters or whatever. But yeah, when I sit down to, to write, I have no idea how it's going to start. So you don't even like know the ending, the middle, none of it. Uh, you know, I have, I mean, I can't help but have an idea. Listen, I want to do a story. It's about so-and-so and so-and-so, but I don't write all that down. I don't type it down. I just sit down. Okay. You know, and, and I just start typing. Um, with, with Salvage Title, my, my most famous series, the one that's been made into a movie, I sat down, you know, and I just started typing. Okay. Doesn't get any simpler than that. How about Rob? You a pantser or you an outliner, man? Generally speaking, I'm a pantser. I have come to believe, um, first of all, that the, the the, the dichotomy that you present is really not a dichotomy. It's a spectrum. And I know we hear that all the time and so many other things, but it's really true here. I generally am a pantser. But I, I started using the Save the Cat beat sheet just to sort of keep me going. There's a chunk usually at about fifty to 70,000 words where I start struggling because the the story gets too big for me to remember everything I need to have in my in my structure. And, uh, you know, I, I end up getting stuck. Where, what do I want to write? I'm not quite sure. Uh, well, I tried this, and it has made that particular slowdown not so much an issue. Uh, I managed to blow right through it to 75,000 words, and then I got distracted with a number of other projects. Generally speaking, I'm a pantser because I really like the uh, – my, my writing style is I create a character – I then role play the character as if I'm playing D&D or if I'm acting on stage and, and I try and do whatever that character will do and that character will often surprise me. That's the advantage to me of pantsing is letting the character be an actual character. Okay. Well, so I think we can all agree that everybody writes their stories a different way. Let's talk about where the genesis of those stories begin, all right? It's got to start from somewhere, all right? Some guys like Kevin J. Anderson go for a nice long hike somewhere in the Colorado mountains, and a story comes to them, whatever that may be. Other people like the aforementioned Stephen King, that guy will watch a cat take a dump in a litter box and be like, the stand, the stand, that's what I'm going to write today, people. So what is it that kind of drives you guys to be able to write stories? Where does that eureka moment typically happen? It can be a setting, can be just surroundings, it can be just something happening in life. Where do your story ideas typically start? And uh, Rob, I'll give you first dibs on this one. 
Well, for me, it's it's often it, it much more like Stephen King in the sense of, oh, I, I just saw a cat take a dump, uh, you know, <laughs> that kind of a thing. Um, uh, I find I get a lot of ideas. You know, we, we all have the, the joke about we get our best ideas standing in the shower. Uh, I, I do that and I uh, try and, you know, immediately after getting out of the shower, put them down, you know, put them recorded somewhere. Um, I get a lot of ideas driving long distance. There's a chunk in that where your mind gets really um, it's bored with seeing the same road, but it's active and it's thinking. And I find that very, very fresh. I, I also uh, am a big fan of uh, Raymond Chandler's writing philosophies in general. And one of those things that he uh, said that I think is one of the most useful tools uh, for any kind of writer, if you don't know what the next thing in the story is, have a man with a gun come into the room. Since I'm writing medieval fantasy, it's often a guy with a sword. Um, but the, the idea is, is that if you don't know what's going on, have something active, have some sort of major conflict scene, just write it. And maybe it doesn't work for that particular story, but once you get that that going, you will find you can use that particular battle slash conflict slash whatever that scene ends up being somewhere. And that's always a good place to start. I don't know what I want to write about. I'll just have somebody come in with a weapon and we'll go from there. Nice. Kevin, how about you, man? What's the genesis of your stories? Where do those things happen for you? A lot of, you know, when I was on the road with the band, uh, you know, the last six years or so as a store manager, uh, you know, I just, there's a lot of window time. And so, I, you know, I'd think and those things would come to me. And I, like I said, I don't outline, but it would come to me. And when, whenever I sat down, I would, would type what I thought. But, you know, I may have thought, you know, through first couple chapters um, without, I mean, like I said, without writing it down as an outline. So that window time really does it for me. And it's that time when I'm alone like that, you know, it's time to think. Um you know, drowning out the guys and, and what they were doing back their music or video games they were playing or whatever uh, on the bus. Uh, but that's where it usually comes from. All right. Um, Is that and, where you and, got salvage title? Yeah. Well, yeah, on the road. But uh, a lot of times music will do it too. You know, you can hear a line or two in music and then that, that'll go from there. So, oh yeah. Oh yeah. You're, you're totally swinging into my take there, man. Music yeah. is a big deal for me. And people who follow me on Twitter know that I'm constantly posting out links to whatever I'm listening to, whether it's Spotify or YouTube, Apple music, whatever. Like I pretty well use all of them at this point. Um, you know, I'll, I'll go so far as to create full length soundtracks to my stories and I'll put those out on Spotify just to salute what the music did for me to help make that story happen. You know, whether it's the you know the classic rock I jammed out to when I wrote the the Swamp Eagle Security Trilogy in the 4HU, or whether it's kind of the the 80s, 90s stuff that I wrote when I, you know, that I listened to when I wrote the Mako series, or, you know, in the case of Detron City Vice, which had a very 80s retro Miami Vice kind of feel to it, it was tons of covers from like the classic Miami Vice hits. So in the air tonight from in this moment or, you know, non-point with, you know, in the air tonight or whatever. Um, you know, all, all of that stuff was there. And I mean, I, that's how I, you know, Rob, to your point, that's how I iron out scenes. Like typically when I'm kind of not really sure where a, a story is headed, I can be on a, you know, on a road or walking down a sidewalk or on an elliptical at the gym or whatever. If I'm listening to the right tune at the right time and the right train of thought, it will just come to me. And I just about have to, you know, step aside with what I'm doing and take a note and keep it to myself. If I'm not anywhere where I can open a laptop and type it up. So uh, music is is very much a big driver for me, both in the beginning of a project and as the story unfolds. Um, that's a huge big deal to me. So, well, let's uh, let's talk about groundwork and world building here for a second. Obviously, if you're you know if you're not writing in sci-fi fantasy, if you're a thriller writer, it's easy to sit down and write about you know a character driving down the road on Panama City Beach because well you live in Panama City Beach and so you know where Thomas Drive is, you know where all the you know the various beach bars are and the hot spots and like you know that world. So you really can just sit down and just let the words and the story flow out of you. When you're talking about something like Salvage Title, which is set mm -hmm. thousands of years in the future on distant worlds, or you're talking about something like The Elder's Legacy, which is you know high fantasy, its own world, those aren't things anybody knows because nobody's made them yet. You've never seen those worlds. So you, know, you have to at some point lay some sort of foundation in advance before you can start the story. I would think, 
Kevin, am I going wrong on that? Do you do you know fr- you know foundational advanced work prep work before you start a story, or do you really just sit down and let it fly? I, on that part, if it's a world building and that kind of thing, yes, I do some prep work. And, and, okay. and let me explain salvage as a matter of fact. I picked 8,000 years in the future. So nobody could say, well, that wouldn't happen. That's not realistic. <laughs> it's 8,000 right. years in the future there, buddy. Listen, 150 years ago, man wasn't going to fly either, and we've been to the moon. Yeah. So let's just stop that right where you're at. You know, oh, well, they can't have they can't have machines that'll just create things out of nothing. How are you going to have uh, we've got printers right now that'll make the lower receiver of an AR-15 that works out of plastic. So if you don't think that they can't dump resources into a machine and out pops components for a ship in 8000 years, sure. that's going to happen. Mm-hmm. And that was deliberate. Um, I, I did that deliberately so nobody could say, oh, that's hand wave you. That ain't no, How you know, buddy. Yeah, <laughs> it was mm-hmm. deliberate. Rob, how about you, man? You're a world building guy. What does that process look like for you? Uh, yeah, I'm a world building guy in part because the world building is the most fun part of writing in my mind. I, uh, for the Eldritch Legacy, it started as my world of Shiyurin. Um And that world, uh, basically, I started by creating uh, interesting places and then putting creating interesting characters. For me, I created a wiki, an actual wiki um, that is live and available. Anybody can go see it. It's out there in part because I want readers to go read it if they want to. Uh, it's at uh, elderslegacy.com slash archives. And uh, basically, whenever I say, oh, I really don't want to write today, but I need to be productive, I will sit in front of my computer and, you know, if I'm watching TV or whatever, and I will just start making up places and characters and events uh i'll I'll outline a dynasty in in a you know that has nothing to do with anything i'm writing i'm just creating it why not and uh, i do all that sort of things sort of out of habit because i'm a historian by training creating the world is the fun part and Mm -hmm. so every once in a while you need to just set back and have fun with it otherwise i mean it's like every job you're working hard to make it work but if you can have fun with it too, that's a nice thing. Oh yeah, no, I could not agree with you more on that point. I'm kind of the same way. Um, I'm I'm definitely pretty anal when it comes to world building. Uh, I do a ton of that. So like, I wrote good grief. I have a I have an eight thousand word Bible, I think, give or take, that's just on the game of Warball for the last Argonaut. Like and Kevin has laid eyes on that, or at least a draft of that. It's been tweaked since then, Kevin, because as I write right. the story, I got to change things. But I mean, I sat down and I created an entire sport, an entire sanctioning body to be able to govern that sport in a galaxy eight thousand years from now. So um, you know that took time. But again, it kind of gets back to you know what I was talking about before when I talked about the playbook. I want these things to make sense. You know, I mean, it's one thing to sit down and just read a a fast-paced action, adventure, sci-fi story, whatever, and there's lots of ships and arbitrary names and things that are thrown out there, and it's zoom, zoom, pew, pew, and that's fun. There comes a point in time, man, when some of that stuff has got to make sense to the reader. And to me, that starts on the front end of of building that, um, you know, going, going into the story. And it makes, honestly, writing the story better. You know, if I already know how an offensive play is supposed to run out of rifle formation, okay, and I know what... You know, trips left or flexor right or, you know, reverse pull or what all that stuff's going to look like on a warball field. If I've already designed all of that and I can envision it in my head, it makes writing the action in the actual chapter a whole lot easier. So um, anyway, that that's a lot of fun. I also really wholly agree with with Rob. There are times when I'm writing something that I just I have to stop and make a thing. You know, I, I I don't need to advance the story right now. What I really need to do is I just mentioned a ship. Well, you know what? I'm going to take the next hour and I'm going to sit here and I'm going to design what that thing looks like. How fast is it? What's it made of? How does it handle in a fight? How many people does it take to crew it? Um, what does it run on? What kind of fuel source? So on and so forth. And that's some of the funnest part about riding. So, uh, all right, well, let's kind of shift gears a little bit toward drafting the actual story. All right, we've got our idea in place. We, we know we want to write a story about X, Y, Z. Uh, we've done our kind of foundational work with world building, uh, maybe even some, some loose character sketches so that we know the, the people who are going to be taking part in this journey with us. Let's talk about drafting. You're starting to write the story. What does the drafting process look like for you guys? And Rob, I'll start with you, man. Of late, the initial drafts that I've been doing 
have been using a sprint feature. Discord, we have a Discord channel for New Mythology Press. Feel free to hit me up and, and join it if you'd like to, uh, to participate. But uh, one of the things I, it has is, a, is a, um, a sprint feature. You tell it sprint for however many minutes. You tell it what your word count is. And then you write for that time and you tell it what your new word count is. And it's one of those things that trips my competitive triggers that, oh, I'm writing. I want to see if I can beat my best score ever kind of thing. Uh, it, it sounds kind of stupid, but it, it works for my way of thinking. And that's sometimes needed. Uh, the one thing that I, I want to emphasize is there is one true way of writing, and it's whatever helps you get words on the page. So if you try sprinting and it doesn't work for you, if you try writing at a coffee shop, it doesn't work for you. If you try writing at a bar, it doesn't work for you. Try listening to music, it doesn't work for you. Whatever way works for you, keep trying until you figure that out because that learning what works for you as a writer uh, is such a personal thing and you have to do it yourself. Nobody else can figure that out. There is no other way but to sit down and do what your brain tells you is the way it works for you. Awesome. So now when you run out that first draft, what is uh, what does the refinement process look like? Like how many drafts do you go through before you finally get to a finished manuscript? A lot of times what I'll do is I'll do a sprint. Like say day one, I do two two or three sprints, and that's about 2,000 words. Day two, I will come back over and I will rewrite those scenes for a couple reasons. One, I do an editing process. Two, I remember what I wrote the previous day, right? Because sometimes you forget. And then, so I, I also, when I do these sprints, I oftentimes don't put everything in. I will put in shorthand for I need to put in a name here or whatever, I need to do X here, but I don't want to stop the writing process. I don't want to stop the flow. So I'll just say, here's a place where I need to keep a note. Okay, great. And move on. So the next day I will go back and I'll clarify those notes. As I'm editing, I'll go, man, I, I know what I wanted to say here. I need to expand it. Quite often when I'm looking at those thousand or 2000 words I did the day previous, rewriting it gets me another thousand or so. Uh, and then I do a couple more sprints. So I've ended up with two or 3000 words in a day if I'm going good, that's the way a day works for me. Uh, and that editing process means that I've already done at least one editing pass on everything. I tend to edit a lot. Um, my final editing process is to print everything off. And there is a thing about humans, generally speaking, all humans struggle to edit unless uh, on a computer screen. You can you're not going to be as good as you think you are. Uh, we have lots of studies that talk to us about why this is true. So printing it off and then reading it out loud. Reading it out loud is crucial here because when you read it out loud, you're forced to actually look at the words at a level that you don't always do. Um, I am constantly missing a word. Like I'll type, uh, I went to planet. Well, I meant to say I went to the planet, right? Uh but the the never happens because I, my brain just goes, blah, this is what I need. Sure. Uh, and so when I edit, I read it out loud and my brain will go, I went to, there should be a the here and I'll see it that way. It's also really useful to help see if you're repeating words. If you say, uh, the, would like to, would like to, would like to, that same structure three times in a row, that gets boring for the reader, at least I think it does. And I catch it and I go, oh, well, I should change this structure and do a different structure, whatever. It's not something I would ever see, even reading from a, a paper copy, but it's something I hear when I'm actually reading it out loud. Oh, and pro tip on that. I'm glad that you brought that up. The uh, Microsoft read aloud feature, or I mean anything now, uh, if you've got an iPhone or an iPad or whatever, if you really want to trip yourself out, turn on the voiceover feature and accessibility for people who can't see the screen like yours truly. It's how I live and die on a phone. Um, have the phone read you what you've just heard or what you've just written. To Rob's point, that is exactly how you find things to change. You'll hear those redundancies. Um, you'll find the, the places where you're missing words. It will make your writing better and it will make your editor love you that much more. Uh, go 
go back and listen to the Maya Cleave uh, or interview if you guys want a, a little taste of what it's like to get into the mind of an editor. She did a great job and some great freaking recipes too because she's a good cook. But um, but yeah, the the reading aloud, listening to your text uh, as a way to to find the flaws that is a great tactic and I use it regularly in my stuff. Kevin, how about you, man? What does your drafting process look like? I know you just write. But at some point, you've got to go back and revise things and refine things. So how does, how does that process look for you? Well, I will go ahead and admit right now that I don't do first draft, second draft, third draft. What I start typing is what I turn in. Okay. That's also, ballsy. Also, I don't have readers. What I turn in, I send to the editor. I haven't had let somebody read. I don't have beta readers, alpha readers, none of those readers. But I will tell you this. Now, here's, here's the reason I can do this. I read very fast. So I can read a novel in three to four hours. So when I start writing, I write the first chapter, second chapter. Let's say I write 3,000 words today. Tomorrow, I will read those 3,000 words. And if I missed a word here, missed a word there, I'll fix it. And then I start writing. Okay? And I might write 3,000 words. Well, the third day, I'm reading 6,000 words. Before I am done, I might read for two and a half, three hours and then finish writing. Every single night, I reread from the beginning of what I wrote to the end. I don't go back a chapter. I don't go back a few pages. I read from the beginning and I fix a word here, fix a word there. Oh, that's redundant. I said that twice. Let me change that. You know, don't use blast twice in the same paragraph. You know what I mean? Little things like that. So as I go, and by the time I'm done, I have reread that story 30, 40, 50 times, depending on how big the story is. Mm. I try to write about 3,000 a day. So you're talking, you know, 25, 30 days worth of, of rereading. But I reread every bit of it. And by the end of the book, I don't even start writing for about three hours after I sit down at my desk. Mm. And that's how I do it. And that's how I'm able to not have but one draft. I don't know what you call that. I don't know the title for that. I don't know what it's termed. I don't even know if anybody else does that. But because I can read like that, and I always have been able to read fast, that's what I do. Mm. Well, to Rob's point, that's the Kevin way. Like That's the way yeah. that works for you. And you've honed that in over how many books now? Uh, I got 11 of my own novels and uh, 26, 27 short stories published since since late 2018. A lot of, lot of practice for finding that process, big time. Rob, real quick, this wasn't uh, wasn't on the list of questions I intended to get to, but it, I, he does raise a, an interesting topic here that I didn't want to catch your take on. Beta readers, yay or nay? Now, I definitely have advanced readers. We definitely use advanced readers at CKP and at New Mythology all the time because that's one of the ways we try and get people interested in, in the book in the first place. We have a crew of advanced readers. Um, Amazon will allow you to send advanced copies to readers. Uh, and in turn, uh, if they choose to put up a, a, a review, they are not required to. If they choose to put up a review, that can really help a book move along. We do that as a matter of course. But this idea of alpha reading, uh, seeing something before it's done, I think might have some value. I just don't know yet for sure because I haven't yet tried it. My process is probably somewhere in the middle between between you guys. Uh, my first draft is I write like a scalded dog. Like I I don't go back and look things up in the Bible. I don't do any like if if I need to write you know such and such boarded a you know ship bound for Akala. All right, I'm probably going to want to explain what that ship is. I don't want to stop where I'm at and go back and research that. Or, you know, Danny Tucker, um, you know, hopped behind the wheel of his sports car on Miami Beach and drove to Joe Robbie Stadium. Well, I'm going to want to tell readers what kind of sports car that is, but I don't want to stop and research Corvettes at that point in the story. I'll throw in a triple X, which is a, a little marker that I throw in to, to go back and reference things. And I just keep writing until I reach the end of the book. So my, my first drafts typically look like a hot mess because of that. It's just about downloading the story out of my brain, trying to get it onto the page. And then I go back and refine from there. So, you know, case in point, I want to say my last three books, first drafts, like 50,000 words, something like that, 40, 50,000 words, like that's a novel. But by the time I go through drafts two and three, three is kind of like the, the two is where the, the real heavy lifting comes on the changes. The third draft is kind of like the final coat of wax on the car before I roll it out of the garage. But, you know, by the time I get through that, 45,000 words, 40,000 words becomes 75 uh, because that's where I'm really fleshing out the details about the planet. I am stopping to take time to describe the car, describe the ship, 
build the process, so on and so forth, to, to throw in kind of the more sensory stuff. But the story is downloaded in that first draft. The way it paces, the big events of the story, all of that happens in, in the, the D1 download. So um, that's kind of mine. We're starting to come down on time here, so I kind of want to pick this up a little bit. Um, Kevin, I'm going to give you next dibs on this question. Give me uh, the thing you love most about the drafting process or the writing process and the thing you like least about the writing process from beginning to uh, turn in the manuscript. What do you like? What do you don't like? I just like uh, I just like just putting the story down, just getting it out. Uh, I like the way the characters will, will make a left turn and just run off and do whatever they want, and I never mm-hmm. expected it. I like that. What I don't like is rewriting everything a second time, rewriting everything a third time. And that's probably why I don't do the drafts. I, I do it as I go, you know, cause I, I I'm just not going to rewrite, you know? So maybe that's what I dislike. Rob, how about you, man? I, I like to know where the story goes. I, I mean, it, it sounds stupid in some ways, but I want to know how it ends. So getting the first draft, the, my favorite part is figuring out how it ends. Uh, cause I don't always know, even when I do, even when I try this, um, this uh, this outline thing, my outline ideas, my beat sheets are are really minimal. They are four hundred words that says something along the effect of, "Going to have a battle scene here, and and this is why." So, uh, the biggest thing for me, I, I want to know what happened. <laughs> I know some people, uh, you know, I I, I want to know. I want to know what happens to the characters. That's the best part. Uh, the worst part, there is a chunk in the middle where it becomes a drag. Uh, It varies. But if you're doing 100,000 words, it's not something you're going to write in a day, right? It's something that will take X amount of days to write. It's really exciting to get a new novel started because you are, um, uh, you're you're fresh. The ideas are fresh. The characters are fun. You really want to, you can't wait to do bad things to these characters because that's what we do as writers. You can't wait for all of this stuff to happen and you're excited because you're just start you're starting a new project. At the end, when you get close to the end, you're like, "I'm on top of the hill. I'm going to be able to do this. This thing is going to get finished, and it's going to get finished in X amount of time." But I know in my head it's going to get done. Those two exciting points are awesome. In the middle, there's the slog. There's the I got to write it. I got to put these things in place. I got to make sure things happen so that there is the sequence, the correct sequence of things. And that part can get tedious. And that's where I think the Save the Bet, uh, Save the Cat beat sheet has helped me at least a little bit. Fair enough. All right. Well, that actually ties nicely into my next question for you guys. Turnaround time on an average novel. Kevin, I'm going to start with you on this one. Let's say I come to you and I need um, 85,000 word military science fiction novel. On average, how long is that going to take you to crank out? 85,000 words. If that's all I'm doing and I'm not bouncing, um, in two months, it's in your hands. Easy. Done. Yeah. Rob, how about you? Uh, I'm more like four months if that's the only thing I'm, I'm doing. But honestly, uh, I never only do that. Like I, And it's not simply because of New Mythology Press, although that has really gotten in the way of late. Um, a couple of other things as well. I got sick. Um, but honestly, those, um, it takes me longer, um, than it does Kevin. Kevin's, I'm not a particularly fast writer. When I go, when I have good months, I have been able to write 60, 70,000 words in a month. They were crap words. They needed to be edited, of course, but it's happened. Okay. But that is the rarity. And most of the time I, I really try to put out three, 30, I put up, try to put down a thousand words a month, a day on average, which is about three months, four months with the editing process. Okay, cool deal. Yeah, I'm more like a, I'm about a six month guy. Um, I've done it in as little as four, when it, particularly when I was collaborating with Chris, because between the two of us, we could really bang it out. Um, but if I'm writing a solo novel, uh, it, I'm typically a good six to six month guy. But and, and a lot of that is my fault. I get really tied up in the slog, as uh, Rob likes to call it. And sometimes I spin my wheels on things that I would probably be just fine moving along with. But um, but I sit there and I pick at it, I pick at it, and I pick at it. I've, I've compared it to tuning a guitar or, you know, making a, a good pot of, of stew. 
you salt and pepper to taste in the stew, or you you bend the string with the guitar, and it's a process. Bend a little, listen to the sound. Nope, it's flat. Lighten off a little bit. No, nope, now we're sharp. We're tightening it up. Now you're sharp. You know, too much salt, a little bit more broth. Finally, you get to the taste that you want. Writing is very much the same way for me. Like, I just have to kind of sit there and play with the language, particularly in the dialogue section, until it sounds the way I want it to sound. And that gets back to kind of what Rob touched on earlier about listening to your work. It's really critical that you do that. So, okay, last question I have for you guys. And this one is really just kind of a service to our readers. Give me three good, solid tips that you would give for a new author. All right, somebody who's who's maybe just getting started or, or just wrapped their first ever manuscript, they're getting ready to do something with it, um, you know, or or it could just be somebody who's just getting started. I have a story idea and I don't know how to get this down on the paper. Give me three good tips that you would give for a new author. And Rob, I'm going to start with you on this. Set yourself a time and a routine to actually throw words on the page. Doesn't matter what it is, but if you get in a routine of throwing it at least a few hundred words on a page. I say I want a thousand, good thousand words in a day uh, on average. That's 365,000 words. I never have gotten quite there, but that's two, that's two to three novels and short stories. Um, and that's anybody that, that, that's reasonable production for any professional author. Set yourself times to do things that fit with your own personal uh, working style. Again, everybody has their own way. Uh, like I say, I use sprints. I will go to a bar and write. Um, I will try and do all sorts of tricks to make sure I'm getting stuff on the page. But getting it, doing it every day is the key thing. I actually went through a stretch now of two weeks. Finally got back on the horse yesterday. Um, and it's hard to get back on the horse because you get a momentum going. You get a thousand words the first day, and then suddenly you're doing two thousand words a day because you're going off that one thousand and you're updating it, getting that extra thousand, and then you're doing another brand new set of thousand, and suddenly you're you're, you're flying. But if you have to take a break, like I got sick, um, if you have to take a break, you lose that momentum and you kind of have to start from scratch. So get yourself a routine, write a little bit a day. All right. Kevin, how about you, man? What are a couple of tips that you would give to a new writer just getting started in this business? Well, first of all, um, you can't edit what you didn't write. So just write. By God, sit down and start writing. Okay. And then just to touch off of what Rob was saying about set up a time. If you're going to write five days a week and you want to write 2000 a day, then set that time so you can do that. Um, if you can't write seven days a week, don't try to say you are and you're not. You have got to be honest with yourself. If you say five times a week, I'm going to write 2,000 words, and you skip a day because the latest uh, episode of whatever you want to watch on Netflix came out, and now you're binge watching, and you didn't write, and you're telling yourself, I'll just write 4,000 tomorrow. No, you won't. Be honest with yourself. You're not going to do that. I don't do that. If I don't write my 3,000, I'm not writing six tomorrow. So let's be honest, set your times and stick to it. Be honest with yourself, you know, and hold yourself accountable to those times. And then the third thing is everybody has words that they use more than they should. So when you get done writing, I don't care if it's a short story. I don't care if it's a novel. You go up there and you search the word just, and you go up there and you search the word only, you know, and then you look for those and say, Oop, I didn't need that. Mm hmm. You Microsoft know? Word is a dangerous place when it comes to yes. that sort of stuff, man. It'll make yeah. you cringe real quick in a hurry, won't it? <laughs> yeah. Yep. And, and the other word you need to search is that. And I will go ahead and let everybody know. You're going to write it just like this. It was the same car that he saw yesterday. Nope. It was the same car he saw yesterday. <laughs> that does not belong in that sentence. Search for that. Pull it out. Fair enough. Unless it's dialogue, it doesn't belong. Fair enough. Well, my uh, my little nuts of wisdom here are pretty much what these guys have already touched upon. Uh, I think it's critical that you you establish your butt time, man. Just like both these guys just said, you got to establish a time and a routine for yourself to do nothing but just write. Even if it's just 30 minutes, three days a week, all right, that adds up over weeks and months over the course of a year. You can write a lot of content in that time, all right, even if it's just crap words like Rob says. You know, get them, get them down. Uh, you, you know, like Kevin said, you can't edit what you didn't write. And that starts with setting your routine and make it reasonable. You know, if you realize that you can't, you can't, you know, realistically do 
two hours, three hours of writing time a day? Well, crap. You know, who among us really can that have full-time day jobs and families and so on and so forth? I get about an hour every day in the morning when I can shut everything off and I can sit in here and write. And my goal is to put down 1,000 words minimum five days a week. That's it. That's what I shoot for. But you know what? That could add up to upwards of two, three novels if I really want it to over the course of a year. I want to add one more thing real quickly, touching up something Kevin said. Uh, he's right. You've got to be absolutely honest with yourself. But one of the things you need to break down is you need to break down the difference between excuses and reasons. Excuses are, I really just didn't feel like it. Reasons, I'm sick. My dog died. Yeah. Yes. My dad died. Uh, I just finished a novel and I'm worn out. Uh, I just had to move. Uh, real reasons in our lives happen, and you must take those into account. You can't simply ignore the fact that you just moved and you, it takes you some time to get back into the writing group. Your parent dies, you are going to be knocked out. Maybe you throw words on the page, but they're not going to be your best stuff. Understand the difference between excuses, which you should be honest and get get on yourself about and, and reasons which you should allow yourself the the opportunity to um, not slack off but understand that your productivity is going to be low when reasons actual real reasons occur mm -hmm. oh yeah that's a great piece of advice uh, totally agree with that um, you know book a boba fett new episode excuse got to move from north carolina to florida in two weeks reason um you know to totally understand that um other thing that kind of goes hand in hand with this guys is shut off the distractions all right set your your phone to mute my wife knows when i come in this office and i close the door she is not to interrupt me unless the, the house is on fire or something's happened with the kid or whatever like if there's a, an, a legit emergency then fine come get me but when the door closes I shut off Facebook, I shut off Twitter, I shut off texts, I mute my phone. That's that. I'm off the grid. And that's the only way I'm going to get productive because trust me, I can swipe, I can scroll on Twitter with the best of them. And that can't be present whenever I'm trying to be in thought, be in the moment and write the story. And then lastly, and this kind of falls more on the marketing realm of things, if you are, you know, if you're that person that you can, can grind and finish the story, finish the project, number one, kudos to you. Uh, the vast, vast, vast majority of people will never get to that step where they actually start it and then they finish it. So number one, give yourself a big old pat on the back for just getting that far. If you're going to take it to market, though, whether it's as an indie or whether it's as a small press author or, or whatnot, make sure that you get three things. Um, number one, set yourself up a, a solid website. It doesn't have to be anything fancy, all right? Wix, a lot of these places will give you a nice, solid, simple website that is mobile-friendly, looks good on mobile devices, and will tell people what they need to know about you and your books. Who are you as an author? What are your books? What do you write? Where can they find those books? And do you do cons, all right? The, the need to know you information. Put it on a site, roll out. The next thing you really need to do is a newsletter. And I wish to high heaven somebody had had told me that when I started you know, doing this, when I put out my first book almost 10 years ago now, get a newsletter. In this day and age of social media and algorithms deciding who sees your content and who doesn't, newsletters are people who have said, I want to know when you're putting out something new. I like you and I want to follow your stuff. It's a direct pipeline to the people who are going to buy your books. So establish yourself a newsletter and put it on your website. And then the third thing is just pick one social network. You can do two if you really, really want, but pick one social network that you A, like, and B, where your audience hangs out and market on that. But please don't be that person who gets wrapped up in six social networks because as we say in the media business, you got to feed the beast. And that means when you establish a content and people start to establish a, a presence on a, on a network and people start to follow you, they expect you to put out content. And if you're not doing it, they don't care about you anymore. So pick a platform that you like and, uh, and then roll out from there. 
So, all right, fellas. Well, that is going to do it for this particular stretch. Uh, listeners, I hope you liked it, man. I mean, listen, you got some some real pearls of wisdom in here from three best-selling sci-fi and fantasy authors, one of whom runs a publishing company. All right. So, hope you, uh, you, you took some notes, maybe learned a few things. Again, if you got questions for us, we're here to try and help you out as much as we can. That is one awesome thing about the writing community is whether we work together or not, we all try and help each other and boost each other's signal. So, email us at dudesinhyperspace at gmail.com or make sure you follow us on social media. Let us know you're out there and how we can help and we'll, we'll do our best to assist you. But uh, thanks, fellas, for the awesome discussion. And that is going to take us down to halftime. <laughs> halftime is, of course, where we show some love to our presenting sponsor. That would, of course, be Chris Kennedy Publishing. We say it at the top because it matters, folks. Doesn't matter what you're into. Space opera, military, sci-fi, urban fantasy. Bada boom. They got it everywhere. It's chriskennedypublishing.com. Go there, check it out. Grab yourself a book and maybe a free ebook while you're at it. So again, chriskennedypublishing.com. Uh, we have a new release this week because, well, those happen every Friday at Chris Kennedy Publishing. This week, we are headed to The Fallen World, which is a post-apocalyptic universe with a brand new book from J.P. Chandler called Revenant. Uh, Rob, what can you tell me about this one? The Eureka Bubble is no longer isolated from a world still struggling after the apocalyptic finale. Fina- bah. Finale. Wow. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll try going to go to talk one of these days. Maybe, maybe going to kind of speak English is useful for a podcast. Who knew? Anyway, still struggling after the apocalyptic finale to the corporate wars. Regaining contact with the outside communities helped cure the problem of dwindling resources. But it also brought new challenges for the bubblers to overcome. Princess, also known as Kelly Anson, has already learned firsthand how dangerous this new reality could be, and she barely survived. Recognizing the bubble holds a wealth of resources compared to most of the rest of the world, Princess will stop at nothing to protect her home. Enlisting her brother Scott and former Obsidian agent Morgan Campbell, she continues to work toward a future where the bubble and its neighbors can embrace life beyond mere survival. But the resources of the bubble make a tempting prize for anyone with the guts and the power to take them. When Princess's father returns with a squad of specialists and con mods and decides he wants the bubble for his own, can Princess and her allies stop them from repeating the mistakes and horrors of the past? Or will she become just another victim of this fallen world? Ba 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 boom! All right. Uh, also happening around the world of Chris Kennedy Publishing, we got some new stuff out in audio this week in the form of Warrior Embraced. This is book three in the Singularity War series from David Halquist. Uh, if you've been waiting for the for the trilogy to close out before you jump on this one, guys, well, now it's here and it's here in audio. And I mean, for crying out loud, guys, I mean, what are we doing here? We got a dude with a rifle riding on top of a freaking dragon. I mean, geez, if that doesn't sell some books, I don't know what uh, will. Well. But again, Warrior Embraced, out now in audio from uh, from Chris Kennedy Publishing. And that is, of course, by David Halquist. Uh, we also have additional news in the form of launch team readers are needed for a brand new book in the Salvage Title universe. Kevin, who's this one from and what's it called? It's, the book is titled Sunrise Over Shippo, and it's by Melissa Olthoff, and it is outstanding um, as as you guys know, I read everything that comes in the Salvage Universe, uh, every word, no matter how many books there are. And I believe this is going to be uh, number 17, number 17 in the universe. Nice. I so, love Melissa Olthoff. I met her, I guess it was last year at Fantasy. And it's always a hoot to get paired up on panels with new authors who are it, like everything is new. Everything is freaky cool to them, you know. And she kind of had that look of somebody who was just so excited to be there. And and since then, she has totally like morphed into CKP. She's got a website now. Like she's writing full length novels. She's awesome. But uh, it was it was a hoot being on a panel with a, a panel with her because she's about our, she's about my age. You know, she's she's you know, Generation X, that that whole deal. She's a mom. She's got a family and all that. And we were on a panel together about music and writing. And somehow I got off on the subject of grunge. And she was just like, yes, yes, we can totally go down this road. I'm like, I know you and I are going to do great together. So anyway, Melissa Althoff, we were super tickled when it came across the wire that you were doing a full like novel at Salvage. So absolutely way to, way to go get it. Good luck to you on that. But anyway, back to the matter. If I can add, if I can add, Melissa was at that fan to side because she sent me a story in the open call for songs of valor and she was one of the three fine one of the four finalists for the um 
fantasy contest. And she actually sent me another story for an open call for Talons and Talismans. Uh, she's no longer in the open calls. She's too good. She doesn't. Uh, she doesn't have to to deal with that because she's earned the spot. Her writing is fantastic. Awesome, Melissa Althoff, folks. Sunrise over Shippo. It's a brand new book that's getting ready to come out from the Salvage Saddle Universe. And if you want an advanced read on that, well, go to chriskennedypublishing.com, Send in an email. Let them know that you want to be on the launch team, and they will get that hooked right up, real quick, and in a hurry. Because that is the way we roll at CKP. One more time, chriskennedypublishing.com. Go forth, check it out. You got mail. All righty, that is going to take us down to our pot mail segment, which is where we like to see what our listeners have to say. i uh, got to give a quick shout out to the wonderful folks at the International Association of Science Fiction and Fantasy Authors, IASFA as we call them. This is a fantastic organization, guys. No matter whether you're an author or whether you're a reader, they got something for everybody over there. All right, if you're a writer, go to their site and check it out. All right, join, sign up and get an account. It's free. And then start building community. All right, find other people that are in your genre. There are going to be opportunities there to do networking. There are going to be opportunities there to share deals, do newsletter swaps, that sort of stuff. Uh, there'll also be opportunities for you to feature your books in giveaways and monthly genre promotions when the time comes. So uh, again, lots of opportunities there to just get to know your fellow authors and cross-pollinate with stuff. Very, very helpful. For readers, Dude, we got giveaways all the time. We've got book bundles, most recently with Young Adult Science Fiction. Uh, back in December, there was a big space opera giveaway. All this is your top-notch reads that come to you either for free or at a wonderful rate. So uh, again, no matter whether you're an author or whether you're a reader, International Association of Science Fiction and Fantasy Authors has really got a lot of good stuff going on. And to know more about them, you can go check them out online at IASFA.org. Again, that's IASFA. Org. All right. First question comes to us from Don. Hey, fellas, I'm a new author who is about to publish his debut space opera novel. I would like to find a way to get this book into audio without breaking the bank. Any suggestions on how I can go about doing that? Uh, yeah, actually, there's really two big players in the audio scene, Don. Uh, ACX is the, is the biggie. That's the one that's owned by Amazon. That's Audiobook Creative Exchange. Um, think of it like a match.com for authors. You go on there and narrators, people will will check out your little sample script that you put out and decide whether or not they want to read it. And if they do, they'll hit you up and you can do either a royalty share, which doesn't cost you anything up front, or you can just pay them their rate and then you know you get to keep all the royalties when the books come through. For new authors, the royalty share way is a, is a great way to go because again, it's, you know, it doesn't cost you anything on the front end. The only downside to that is, last I checked, I think they're exclusive to Amazon, iTunes, and and uh, or is it uh, Google Play Music, one of those? So they're they're a little bit limited with their scope, and they're going to control the rights to your audiobook for, I think it's either five to seven years, maybe five now. So uh, you, you are kind of confining yourself if you go with them. Uh, the other group is called Find Away Voices. I don't know much about them. I know other authors who have dealt with them, uh, but I go through my publisher for audiobooks. So it's been, been a while since I've done the indie thing, but I do know that Find Away Voices is out there, and they will get your uh, um, audiobook out to all the usual suspects. Uh, Rob, you got anything to add on that from kind of the new mythology publisher's hat front on audiobooks? Uh, no. Um, honestly, audiobooks are challenging, and it's one of the things that I don't have a great grasp on yet, and I'm, I'm working to learn. Um, for someone who is new, um, the ACX exchange uh, can be a way to go. I wouldn't expect to make money at it, but it's one of those things that provides an opportunity for the, your readers, uh, new readers, to get into your stuff. Uh, it's it's very difficult to make money at that, and some of that's because Amazon uh, has such a tight control over it, and the margins there for what you get compared to what Amazon gets and what the reader gets, just there isn't a whole heck of a lot there. That being said, it's definitely something you you, you know, ACX is a good good place to start. Next question comes to us from Doug. Speaking as a lifelong Washington Redskins fan, I've got to side with Ian in that I was a little bit underwhelmed with our new identity, the Washington Commanders. Don't get me wrong, I get why ownership felt like they had to make the switch, and I even like the uniforms. But Commanders? Really? What are your thoughts? Uh, Kevin, I'll start with you on this, man. Uh, Washington, finally, they're no longer the football team. They, they finally rolled it out this week. They are the Washington Commanders. Uh, what were your thoughts as a fan, fan of football, whenever you saw that? I mean, it, 
I guess commanders, commander in chief, Washington, Washington D.C. I don't know where they got that from. I, I, I don't want commanders. I really don't. I don't know. It just doesn't doesn't. Maybe it's because it's new, and I'm that guy that doesn't like anything new. But two weeks later, I'm fine with it. So, right. so who knows? Rob, how about you, man? The commanders. What were your thoughts on that? It would take the Washington franchise to turn a name like Washington football team and get something even more bland and lazy. <laughs> I was waiting for that. I kind of figured you'd have a take on that. Honestly, they had so many good options based upon their history. You know, the Hogs. Yep. I, I, I'm not a, I'm a Cowboys fan, so I automatically hate the Washington franchise. Deservedly so. I've got years of hate for them. But I have a ton of respect for the Hogs. That was a heck of an offensive line, Russ Grimm and, and all those guys. And that was, in many ways, the best identity of the Redskins. And sure, who wants to be the Hogs? Well, if you're a lifelong Washington Redskins fan, you do want to be the Hog because that's what you were. You were a, a dominant uh, offensive line. You had Riggins and you had so many other running backs. Timmy Smith had one great game in his life, and it was the Super Bowl where they blew out the Broncos 55 to 10. That was the Hogs. Yeah. Go, they should have just gone with the Hogs and said, screw it. We're going to be actually something as opposed to commanders. Yeah. No, I <laughs> – props to uh, an author friend of ours who I don't know if he wants me to name him or not, so I won't. But uh, for posting in the Facebook group whenever I, I posted the picture of the uniforms and the logos, his response was – Let's go, commies! <laughs> oh, I was like, oh, wow. And somewhere, some poor market research guy was just like, crap, how did we not catch that? <laughs> but uh, but no, I I was not bowled over by this one. I did think the uniforms looked fairly decent. I, I'm glad they kind of stuck with the whole burgundy and gold thing and, and, and did go with that. Uh, the logo is also fairly decent looking. But yeah, commanders, I was just like, it, it sounds like one of those generic monikers that they give you when you start a fantasy football league team and you can't really think of anything for your own. So it's just like, hey, here's the Jacksonville Sharks, which is actually an arena team. Or here's the New Mexico Stampeders. And here's the, you know, the Iowa Corn Growers. This is like in that realm for me, you know. So next question comes to us from Kyle. Uh, my question is for Rob. Now that Sean Payton is officially out in New Orleans, what are the odds that he resurfaces in Dallas in 2023? Also, did any of the new coaching hires strike you guys as being potentially franchise changing? Uh, thanks for taking my pod mail. Uh, Rob, you got any thoughts on Sean Payton to the Cowboys? People have been dreaming about that for years, it seems, in Cowboy Nation. You know, I think it's one of those things that people dream of and it doesn't necessarily happen. Uh I, I don't know. I mean, suppose, let, let's assume Mike McCarthy has a really poor season next year, which I don't expect. But the resume of Sean Payton versus the resume of Mike McCarthy, they're honestly almost exactly the same. Both had a franchise quarterback. Both won one Super Bowl. Um, Sean didn't do as well, actually, as McCarthy did in terms of uh, being in uh, championship games. So, you know, maybe, but I, I don't necessarily see it as a huge improvement over McCarthy. Um, as for the game changing for the respective franchises, I'm not terribly impressed with a lot of the choices so far. Uh, part of that is for a good reason, actually, because the number of the coaches are not experienced retreads. Um, we, we, you know, for example, we have the coach in Denver, I'm blanking on his name, but Nathaniel Hackett. New, yeah. He's a new, he's an, he, this is his first opportunity. Um, I have real problems with Josh McDaniels in Vegas. Right. Uh, uh, he failed poorly at, uh, Denver and then he backed out on the Colts and the Belichick tree at this point has been really bad like there haven't been that many good coaches uh flores brian flores who obviously is in the news for other reasons uh, was actually one of the better coaches out of that tree and he had basically a 500 record so i am not enthralled with mcdaniels there uh if that's going to be a game changer 
it may be a negative game changer. Gotcha. Kev, uh, how about you, man? Have you any of these coaching hires really grab you? I don't really grab me. I'm glad to see a few of them, you know, Jacksonville and, and the like. I was very surprised to see Miami change coaches. Um, I am going to be interested to see how the Brian, I think his last name is Dable. That's how you pronounce it. Uh, offensive coordinator from Buffalo, who's now the head coach at, at New York. I mean, listen, the guy did an amazing job with Josh Allen. I, from what I understand, that offense is completely of his making in Buffalo. And we saw, you know, in the divisional round this year, just how freaking spectacular that offense could be. Well, he was the architect of that. He's also off of the the Nick Saban tree, uh, was the guy responsible for making Tua, which really kind of surprises me that Miami didn't try and hire him. But New York got him. And so now he's going to be working with Daniel Jones, Saquon Barkley, all those guys. And I, I think we're going to finally get to the guts of whether or not New York believes in Daniel Jones. So I think that's going to be a fun one to uh, a fun one to find out. But all right, well, let's get to our last question here because we're definitely ticking over time. Last question is a fun one, and I've actually been kind of looking forward to this one. This one comes from Laney. Hey, fellas, the fam and I are gearing up for our annual Super Bowl party tradition here at our home in Dothan. All right, Alabama girl. I'm in need of some new hors d'oeuvre suggestions. Any recommendations? Uh, Kevin, your wife is no stranger to making some awesome vittles on game day, uh, game day, man. Have you got any kind of little bits of enlightenment that you want to toss this lady's way? I'm afraid I might be a creature of habit because it's always wings for me. All right. Though this, this year, not only am I going to have, you know, the standard Buffalo wings, um, she is going to take some wings, hit them with lemon pepper, and then we'll hit them with some barbecue sauce. Okay. So it's, 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 it's both. And, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to that. If you I ever want to kind of fire that up a little bit, pun intended, uh, hit them with a little bit of, of olive oil and lemon pepper and then smoke them mm. and then either finish them in the grease with uh, with frying them or finish them on the grill. Ah, really okay. superb. Rob, how about you, man? You got any particular game day items that you like, stuff that's fun to have at a tailgate for food? Well, I admit to being sort of obvious here because for me, I love cheese dip. I, I love spicy, spicy cheese dip. So for me, it's it's tortillas and uh, cheese dip, and then everything else. All because right. Frankly, I dip everything else in the cheese dip to begin with. <laughs> hey man, if it works, don't don't mess with it. Um, I'm I'm kind of the same way. Uh, I would tell you. I mean, the Cincinnati Bengals are played in the Super Bowl this year. Um, how about a little skyline chili dip? You know. Hit, hit Pinterest, hit foodnetwork.com. There are tons of recipes that are, you can throw together in 15 minutes with little or no prep whatsoever. A uh, little Skyline chili dip would be fantastic at a Super Bowl party this year. I know my wife is going to spend some up for ours because uh, we're having a bunch of people here over to the house, most of whom are from Cincinnati. So it's going to be a heavy Bengals crowd here. Um, as far as kind of go-tos for me, um, I'm a big fan of what I call Swedish meatballs, and they're just sweet-ish. Uh, basically, I'll go to the store, get a family-sized pack of frozen homestyle meatballs, nothing fancy. Dump them in a crock pot, and then I take two bottles of Heinz chili sauce and a large jar of grape jelly, dump all of that into a pot and saute it until everything is good and blended together. Then I pour that over the meatballs in the crock pot, let it go for four hours. Yeah, set out a, a pack of toothpicks and some paper plates and people go nuts. Um, another one that, that is always a real hit around our house, we call them ham roll-ups. Just take you a big package of, of regular old sandwich meat ham. Take out of a, uh, a piece of it and slather it down real good with cream cheese. Take you a couple of scallions and then roll the entire thing up like a, a ham fruit roll-up. And then take your knife and slice them. So make little kind of pinwheels out of it and stake it with toothpicks. Put those out on a serving tray, the fresh cream cheese, the ham, the scallions, give a little bit of crunch, and those are always a hit. So uh, those are those are two of my, my go-tos. I got a Mexican dip that's uh, that's always a hit, but and typically I'm, I'm not going to roll that one out with barbecue, which is what's on the menu for us at this particular tailgate party. So, all right. Well, thanks everybody for sending in your questions. You know, we always love to hear from you guys. Uh, one more time, if you got a question for our next show, send it to us, man. Dudes in hyperspace at gmail.com or hit us up on social media. But that's going to take us down to the white flag. So let's hit it. White flag. All right. White flag is that segment where we kind of tell folks what we're looking for coming up in the days and weeks ahead. Can be writing stuff, can be sports related stuff, can be music stuff, whatever. Like whatever we fancy, that's what we talk about in white flag. In this distance, I'd be remiss seeing as how we're probably not going to cut another episode before the Super Bowl if I didn't raise that because we know we're all fans and we've all got our opinions and we definitely need to make some picks. Otherwise, people may throw rocks at us. So uh, real quick, guys, I'll give each of you the mic. Tell me what you're looking forward to about the 
the game, what, you know, what interests you about this matchup, and then give me your pick, man. And Rob, I'm going to start with you. I want to see how well the Bengals play the very quick passing game, take advantage of the Rams linebackers. I think Joe Burrow is the better quarterback in this, and I think the Rams are going to pull off the upset because there's a major weakness at the second line of defense on the Rams team. Okay, so you're picking the Bengals. Do you want to give me a score? Uh, I think it could be a fairly high-scoring game, say 31 to 27. Ooh, I'd, I'd like to see that play out. I think it's going to be fun. Kevin, how about you, man? Who do you like in this one? I'm liking the Rams. Uh, you know, I'm, I, I like the fact that Matt Stafford moved to the team and they're doing well. I like the fact that, that down in Tampa, Matt Stafford pulled a Tom Brady on Tom Brady. And uh, <laughs> I, I, like to, I like to see a game of about, you know, 34, probably 24 kind of thing. And it's okay. going to be the Rams. All righty. Way to, way to stand by your dogs, man. Your dogs alone. You got to do it. I feel you. Uh, I'm definitely going to throw in with these guys, and I think it's going to be a fairly high-scoring affair. Uh, I think it's going to be a fun one to watch. I, I really do. But, um, you know, man, I, I really believe – I, I believe in elite quarterbacks in big time games. And I, I listen, I like Matt Stafford. I watched the guy play at Georgia his entire career and I followed him all the way through to Georgia. I think he's a great dude and a, and a great ambassador for, for Georgia sports. I think, I think he's a very solid quarterback. I think he's, um, you know, I think he's a, a top 10 guy in the league. I just think he's at the bottom end of that top 10. Joe Burrow, on the other hand, based off of the season and a half that we've actually gotten to see him want, uh, see him play. I've been really impressed with him. I mean, even more so than I thought I would be with him coming out of LSU. And I think that's what you hang your hat on in a game like this. If they can protect him, I think it's going to be wide open. So I'm going to side with Rob on this one, and I am going to take the Bungles, and I'm going to go with, uh, we'll call it 35-28. So, well, thank you so much for the uh, the Believe Podcast folks, Believe Podcast Network folks, for coming on board with us. We are really looking forward to this ride, guys, that we're going to be taking with them. We're talking new guests, new opportunities, new sponsors. Great things happening between the Dudes in Hyperspace podcast and the Believe Podcast Network. Thanks so much to Chris Kennedy Publishing for being the presenting sponsor of this show and also the International Association of Science Fiction and Fantasy Authors for sponsoring our pod mail segment. If you guys want to talk to us, we want to hear from you. Dudes in Hyperspace at gmail.com is the email address where you can find us or hit us up on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. We're on all of those platforms. Finally, if you like the show and you want to support us, it's very easy to do. Leave a comment, leave a review, leave stars if your platform will let you do it. No matter where you're at, whether it's Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, even over on YouTube, like it, smash it, subscribe to it. All those fun terms that young people use and old guys like me constantly screw up, but that's how you do it. It helps us to get up through the rankings. On behalf of Rob, on behalf of Kevin, thank you guys so much. I am Ian J. Malone, and we'll see you next time on the Dudes in Hyperspace podcast. See ya. See ya.